All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so let's talk about APTs today. We're going to specifically talk about Muddy Water, that is an Iranian APT. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen so that you guys can see my presentation. And all righty. All right, hopefully everyone can see my presentation now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashir Malhotra. Today, I'm going to be presenting about the Muddy Water APT. Uh, my talk is titled Muddy Water from Canaries to, to Turkeys. Uh, before we begin, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ashir. Uh, I'm a threat researcher at Cisco Talos. I specialize in malware analysis, threat intelligence, and different kinds of malware detection techniques. More recently, my focus has been on disclosing APT operations, uh, spe specifically in the Asian, in the Asian continent. Right now, I'm located out of the United States. I'm presenting to you from Washington, DC. Now, this research was done in collaboration with Vitor. Uh, Vitor is also a cybersecurity researcher at Cisco Talos. He's actually the research lead for my team for Europe and Asia. Uh, Vitor was supposed to originally present this research, but unfortunately, he couldn't present today, So, which is why you all are stuck with me today. So, yeah. Um, Vitor loves mobile malware and loves to reverse engineer different kinds of malware samples. He's an avid APT hunter, and Vitor is located out of Portugal right now. All right, let's talk about the agenda. So today we're going to talk about four key sections. Uh, we're going to introduce the Muddy Water APT group. We're going to take a look at about five campaigns that have been conducted by Muddy Water in the past year or so. Then we're going to talk about a very novel technique that this APT has started using recently, uh, namely infection tracking. They basically use a methodology, a specific technique to track successful infections across the set of victims. And we're specifically going to talk about homemade tokens and canary tokens. And then I'm going to take a couple of slides and go through the conclusions. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you will know as much about Muddy Water as I do. So fingers crossed. All right, let's talk about Muddy Water. So what is Muddy Water? Muddy Water is an Iranian APT group. It's also known as Mercury or Static Kitten. Uh, very recently, I think at the beginning of this year, it was attributed to Iran's History of Intelligence and Security, the MOIS division, by the United States Cyber Command. Muddy Water primarily tends to target entities, uh, you know, usually government entities in North America, Europe, and Asia. And the focus of their operations is primarily espionage and intellectual property theft and the intention to establish and maintain long-term access into their targets networks. We've seen some sporadic instances of Muddy Water carrying out ransomware attacks as well, but that's a whole different topic of discussion and we're going to be covering that today. Now, we believe that Muddy Water is a supergroup. This is basically an umbrella organization or a conglomerate of groups that consists of smaller groups that focus on individual geographies all throughout the world. That being said, let's take a look at all the different campaigns that have been conducted by Muddy Water over the past year or so. So now the intention of this presentation initially was to talk about three key campaigns and show similarities between them. Uh, the first campaign that we wanted to talk about was uh, one that started in April and Carry, was carried out through August of 2021. This campaign specifically targeted entities in Armenia and Pakistan. The second campaign that we saw Muddy Water conduct was against Turkish entities, and we discovered this in November of 2021. And then there was another, a third campaign that was targeting a lot of countries in the Arabian Peninsula, way more prolific and way more aggressive, that we discovered in December of 2021. During the course of our research, when while we were tracking all three of these uh, campaigns, we discovered that there were multiple overlaps in the TTPs used across all of these campaigns. Basically, a technique would be introduced in one campaign, it would be refined and made reliable, and then it would be migrated to uh, another campaign that was being conducted in a completely distinct and different region uh, of the world. Um, it's not just the reuse of techniques they observed in, in across these three campaigns. We also saw a lot of new techniques being introduced as well. 
and I'm going to talk about them uh, during the course of uh, this presentation as well. Now, uh, when we started looking at these campaigns and the more we delved into these campaigns and the more research we did and the more stuff we uncovered, uh, we realized that in order to present this at uh, uh, you know, a really good conference like NotSec, uh, we needed to go back and take a look at some of the other campaigns that Muddy Water had conducted in the recent years as well. So I'm going to talk through a timeline of all the different campaigns and the different attack instances in this particular template. Uh, we're going to list all of them, and then we're going to list all the salient TTPs that we used in each of these campaigns. So let's start with the first one. The first campaign that I'd like to talk about was conducted by the APT group in March 2021, and this was targeting countries in the Middle East. Um, this specific campaign consisted of phishing emails with lures that were sent to targets. Uh, basically, a PDF would arrive in your inbox that would say, hey, open up this PDF. This is from a legitimate entity. The PDF would contain language that said, hey, you need to download this specific zip file or this archive from uh, this remote location and execute the file inside of it. Uh, what basically happened was that the malicious uh, archives uh, consisted of remote controlled software utilities such as Screen Connect and remote uh, utilities. Um, once the victim executed these utilities on their endpoint, the attackers were able to manually connect to the infected endpoint, and then they would start pivoting and start uh, an entirely new infection chain from there. During the course of this campaign, we also saw the attackers use various types of commodity tools, such as Ligolo, which is a reverse tunneling software, which can be used to establish long-term communication channels uh, between an infected endpoint and the attackers. The screenshot that I have on the screen today is a PDF that masquerades as a circular from the National Media Council of the United Arab Emirates. The content here basically states that uh, we have a new version of the media library. It's available on this link. Please go ahead and click it. Don't ask any questions. Open up the zip archive and execute the file with the, inside of it. And that's how the victims get infected with a remote control software that the attackers then can then connect to. Now, the next attack instance of uh, an operation conducted by Muddy Water was against Pakistan uh, in April of 2021. This attack instance consisted of Maldox being delivered uh, to the victims, uh, usually masquerading as a government document of some sort. Uh, the screenshot that I have on the screen is from a blurred out court case uh, from a Pakistani court. Um, this maldoc consisted of malicious VBA macros that would reach out to a remote URL and then download the ConnectWise remote access client that would be run on the system and then the attackers could connect to it. What's interesting about this campaign and the reason why we wanted to talk about this is because this campaign was, this attack instance was the first instance of tracking tokens being used by the adversary. So for those of us that don't know what tracking tokens are, they're basically uh, URLs that are embedded inside uh, an artifact, you know, an HTML file or uh, an executable or a maldoc. And when that specific artifact is opened up on the endpoint, uh, the artifact will make an HTTP call to that specific URL in order to re register a successful infection for the endpoint with the attackers. The reason why we call this uh, an instance of homemade tracking tokens is because the attackers used their own servers, assigned their own IPs, and managed and operated these servers. And which is why we're calling them homemade tokens. This is basically a homegrown implementation of tracking uh, infection tokens. The next campaign that we observed being carried out by Muddy Water was against Armenia in June 2021. Basically, what happened was, uh, in this case, the attackers would distribute malicious executables that were built based on a builder that they have. Uh, we believe this is a customized builder, and we've seen executables being uh, generated by this builder and being used in other campaigns as well. Uh, at the very core of it, the executable would drop a decoy document. It would uh, also drop and execute a PowerShell-based downloader. Uh, we also saw the attackers use specific file extensions like dot .com extensions for the PowerShell scripts that the executables would uh, deploy on the infected endpoint. And we also saw the use of lolbins to instrument components of the infection chain. 
Now, the screenshot that I have on the screen, by the way, is um, supposed to be a confidential document from Ericsson. It's a, a technical guide of some kind, and it pertains to Viva MTS, which is a telecom services provider in Armenia. So, you know, the attackers uh, know what they're doing. This is basically used to target telecom to communication entities in Armenia. Uh, if you take a look at the PowerShell based downloader, this was a very short and sweet and simple uh, downloader or stager, if I may say. Um, basically, what happens within it is uh, I've got the code uh, screenshotted on the uh, on the slide deck here, but the downloader will basically send out preliminary system information to the command and control server, and then it will wait for the command and control server to issue PowerShell script uh, commands to the infected endpoint to the script. And any of the commands that are received by the script will then be executed on the infected endpoint. So, you know, very short, very sweet, very simple, very tight implementation. Uh, nothing fancy here. Um, you know, it gets them a foothold inside the network and allows them to start executing more commands, uh, you know, manually issuing more commands and start executing more commands on the infected uh, system. Now, uh, an extension of this attack on Armenian entities was also seen again uh, targeting entities in Pakistan in August 2021. Basically, the infection chain is the same. The payloads are the same. You know, this, the same kind of TTPs have been used against uh, this attack against entities in Pakistan. We see the use of the same type of executables that use the same exact same type of uh, PowerShell downloader. They use the same file extensions. They use the same type of lol bins. However, in this specific attack instance, we saw the attackers use homemade tokens again. And what's interesting here is that uh, the homemade tokens used in this case had the exact same IP address as, the, as those seen earlier in a, in a very different campaign targeting Pakistan. This is the one from April 2021. So um, at this point in time, um, um, I'm basically trying to color code all of the salient TTPs in the slide to show you the similarities and the commonalities between the various campaigns. So you see some in orange, some uh, common TTPs in blue across different campaigns, the some in purple. Um, so um, this is basically meant for you to uh, keep track of all the commonalities and all the overlaps in TTPs. Now let's look at one of the uh, one of the very interesting muddy water campaigns from November 2021. This campaign specifically targeted entities in Turkey. We discovered this in November, but this was. Uh, operational, this campaign had been operational since at least September of 2021. Um, in this campaign, the attackers took a two-fold approach. Um, on one hand, they used executables that acted as the droppers and downloaders uh, and the initial infection vectors for the infection chains. But on the other hand, the attackers also used different types of malicious documents as well to instrument the attacks. Now, in the case of the executables, we saw uh, the executables uh, deploy a second variant of a PowerShell-based downloader or a stager. And we also saw the use of different kinds of load builds. At a very high level, um, this is what the infection chain basically looks like. The executable will drop and display a decoy document that is relevant and pertinent to the victims that they're trying to infect. It will execute a PowerShell-based instrument script, which is responsible for executing the PowerShell-based downloader. The downloader will then reach out to the command and control server, which will issue new commands to the downloader, which will then execute those commands on the infected endpoint. Now, as in the case of the previous downloader, we see this new variant also is very short and very simple. You know, basically all there is, the, the core of the functionality in this downloader is to take commands from the command and control server and just execute them nonstop on the infected endpoint. That's it. So basically, the that they're using very small and very compact implants to establish an initial foothold into the networks. Now, uh, I spoke about the, sec the two-fold approach, right? So the second approach that the attackers took during the course of this campaign was to use malicious PDFs that would be opened up by the victim and the PDF would have language that said, uh, we cannot display the, the the content of the document to you. Uh, however, the correct version of the document is available at this location. Please click on this location and open up this document. And that's exactly what happens during the infection chain. The PDF reaches out to a remote location that downloads a, a maldoc. 
the maldoc consists of malicious uh, vba macros that will in turn drop a vbs based instrumenter and a powershell based downloader and then the infection chain is pretty much the same you know the instrumenter will uh, execute the powershell based downloader which will download commands from the remote uh, locations and execute them on the infected endpoint now what's interesting here is uh, the maldocs disguise themselves as reports or forms belonging to different ministries in the turkish government and i've got a few examples here you know we saw reports that uh, you know maldocs that masqueraded as reports from the health ministry the interior ministry or fr from turkey uh, so it's it's kind of interesting that you know they were trying to this gives us an indication that they were actually trying to infect users who have relations with these specific uh, ministries now uh, another interesting point to note here is that the attackers started using canary tokens instead of homegrown tokens in their maldocs so for those of us that don't know uh, canary tokens uh, canarytokens.com is basically a free service that allows you to register a url that you can then put in your artifacts and when those artifacts are run you know the the artifact the executable or the maldoc will reach out to that specific url on canarytokens.com and register a successful infection so um, now we have uh, i i tried to come up with a good meme here but uh, i came up with a really bad meme uh, what happened in november 2021 was that the attackers now switched from the use of homegrown infrastructure for tracking infection tokens you remember i spoke about homemade tokens they moved from homemade tokens to uh, canary tokens and we believe that this is an attempt at legitimizing their infection track muddy water you know a lot of them most of them use powershell based downloaders in one form or the other to establish an initial foothold on the infected endpoints uh, however uh, there was a new campaign in december 2021 and that you know made its way well into 2022 that targeted a multitude of countries in the arabian peninsula what basically happened during the course of this campaign was uh, this is the infection chain you know a phishing email would arrive in the victim's inbox with the maldoc uh, the malicious document would be opened it consisted of a malicious vba macro that would instrument the next stages of the infection chain however what's different here and what's unique here is that the attackers now moved from using powershell based scripts to using wsf based scripts uh, wsf is the window scripting file um, it has the ability to have multiple uh, scripts uh, if i may say or multiple uh, scriptlets uh, inside of the file from different languages and that's what we saw during the course of this campaign we saw uh, the wsf based rat which we are calling slow rat being used to deploy additional malicious payloads on the infected endpoint and we saw the reuse of the ligolo reverse tunneling utility that we saw earlier in march of 2021 uh, being used again in this specific uh, campaign as well so um, uh, let me give you a brief overview of what slowrat is uh, we 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 named the term slowrat but it is also known as canopy Uh, this rat was also disclosed by the cyber security and infrastructure security agency of the united states uh, the cisa agency um, this is a wsf based rat so it contains different uh, snippets of code consisting of bb script and java script and the execution jumps from one snippet to the other in order to carry out the malicious functionality that resides inside of this rat um if you take a look at this specific the rat you know if you just open it up in a text editor you will see that there's a lot of obfuscation here but if you peel through the obfuscation layers at the end of the day it's a very simple rat it has the ability to execute arbitrary commands on the infected endpoints you know uh, the server will issue a command the rat will execute that command on the infected endpoint it then uh, store the output of the command in a text file that text file is uh, uh, subsequently read uh, by the rat and then exfiltrated out to the uh, command and control server the, the rat also had the capability to deploy additional malware payloads and we saw the use of uh, you know as i said the ligolo reverse tunneling uh, utility being used here as well um, by infections uh, by infected endpoints that were running slow rat 
Okay, so at this point in time, uh, we've been through all the different muddy water campaigns. But what I'd like to highlight here is that if you look very closely at these slides, you will see that there there are very there are some very common DDPs. You know, the use of executables across different campaigns. You know, from Armenia to Pakistan to Turkey, the use of uh, remote control utilities from March 2021 that were reused again in December 2021 and well into January at, uh, at the beginning of this year. All right, so let's talk about Canary tokens. So um, Canary tokens, uh, the, the usage of Canary tokens for tracking infection chains is very novel uh, to this specific APT. We haven't seen this before. The first time we discovered this was when uh, we were taking a look at the campaigns, uh, you know, sometime in April 2021. Um, and the more we looked at these campaigns, the more we realized that uh, the attackers were slowly refining this technique. So in April of last year, in the campaign targeting Pakistani entities, we saw that the attackers started using homemade infection tokens, right? Um, this was the experimental phase for the for the for the specific technique. You know, the attack the attackers were testing the waters. They were trying to make sure, uh, uh, you know, they were trying to understand the utility of this technique. Um, they used this technique up until August of 2021. Um, Perhaps around this point in time, the attackers realized that using homegrown infrastructure and homemade tokens was a little bit too noisy. You know, a random document, uh, you know, a suspicious document reaching out to a random IP on your network is, you know, bound to catch somebody's attention at some point in time. Uh, which is why, beginning with the campaign targeting Turkey in November 2021, we saw the attackers try to legitimize their infection token token tracking systems. Uh, they started using a more professional implementation and they started adopting canarytokens.com in order to keep track of their infections, right? Now, um, canary tokens is a very interesting concept. And uh, during the course of our research, we tried to come up with a hypothesis of why the attackers were using uh, you know, homemade infection tracking tokens and canary tokens specifically. Um, so canary tokens can be used for a number of purposes and these are our we, we have four hypotheses the the most obvious one is you know you want to keep track of successful infections uh, on the other hand uh, we believe that canary tokens can also be used for anti analysis so you know basically you can have an instance where um, you send a request to the token server first and only if the token request is received will the server issue a payload to the specific uh, infection so this is a way to thwart uh, isolated analysis of specific components of an infection chain. Um, I believe that Canary tokens can also be used as a form of uh, timing checks for anti-analysis. You know, you check the duration between a, a token request and a request for the payload. And if it's too small, then you, you know, the infection is probably running on a sandbox or some kind of an automated system. Uh, canary tokens can also be used to find protections. Um, you know, if a Token server keeps re re receiving requests from an infected endpoint, but there are no requests for the payload from the infected endpoint. Then that means that uh, you know the victim has some sort of blocking and protection mechanism in place, and the adver adversaries can then modify their strategy and change their uh, techniques and tools in order to uh, achieve a greater degree of success against that specific victim. All right, so I know this is a lot. And uh, I know I rushed through a lot of the uh, the content because there was a lot of content, but I promise that I'm just going to present two more slides to you, and I'm just going to talk about the conclusions here. So, um, in case there weren't enough uh, timeline slides for you, I have yet another one. Uh, this time we've tried to do something different. Uh, on the left hand side, we have a timeline of all the campaigns that we've discussed today. And we've also presented and color coded all the salient TTPs uh, along with the different campaigns, you know, in the bullet points. But on the right hand side, we this is our attempt at showing the different uh, commonalities between all the different campaigns that Water has conducted over the course of the last year. You know, you see the use of honey tokens across different campaigns. We see that the honey tokens were then evolved into a into a completely new and uh, a distinct campaign that was targeting Turkey. We see that 
uh, you know, the similar uh, payload, uh, similar PowerShell based downloaders and file names and extensions and lol bins were used across multiple distinct campaigns. And uh, this indicates that the adversary is reusing their DTPs, you know, they're reusing the DTPs and they're borrowing from one another based on the reliability of and, and you know, the, the utility of a specific technique that they've used in the past. All right, so in conclusion, uh, we believe that Muddy Water is a super group. We believe that it is uh, uh, an umbrella organization that consists of separate teams that are targeting different geographies. All of these teams borrow TTPs from one another. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen evidence of the reuse of their TTPs from one campaign to the other in distinct and different geographies. However, that does not mean that the group is not that the that the individual groups are not innovating on their own as well. We see that the groups are innovating on their own. They they develop their own TTPs. They develop their own suite of tools. They develop their own tactics. They test them out. They refine them. They make them more reliable. And uh, once the utility of these techniques has been proven, they will put them in a common pool of uh, tactics and tools. And these tools can then be utilized by another sub team in a completely different campaign targeting a completely different geography. Now, uh, although there's different tools and techniques being used and there's some amount of co uh, overlap between the TTPs as well, we strongly believe that all of these teams under the muddy water umbrella serve a common set of goals you know they serve the interests of a common nation state which is iran in this case and their primary focus again is to conduct espionage to establish and maintain long-term access into their victims networks and to prime also do uh, some amount of intellectual property theft as well and that brings us to the end of the presentation mm -hmm.